first workshop of the Ambition of Motion program. I'm so excited to have you all here, so excited to get started, so excited for you to begin the endeavor of connecting with a mentor and learning about what you want to do professionally and then getting your foot in the door with professional opportunities. This workshop is, and this program in general is going to help you get to where you want to be as a young professional into your career. During this workshop, we're going to cover how to achieve success in this program, how to expand your network and begin having conversations with people that you want to surround yourself with and how you can begin working towards a goal with your mentor. This specific workshop's all about how do I get my foot in the door with opportunities. This could be an opportunity for a job or an internship. It could be an opportunity to get mentored by somebody, to be an apprentice. It could be an opportunity just to learn from somebody else, to start setting up informational interviews and just building your network. Either way, this is about getting your foot in the door because networking is not a transaction. It's not about, hey, I'm reaching out to you so then you can get me this. Like, don't get me wrong. Your end goal could be to ultimately land an internship and that absolutely can happen, but that is not how it goes about. That's not how you go about doing it. You have to build a relationship. You have to build trust with somebody. You have to build a rapport with somebody. And you know what? It might come about. They might say, hey, my company is actually looking to hire somebody. Or I know this person that you should connect with. And they make an introduction, and that leads to that next opportunity. You never know how this is going to work out. But the key is that you're not expecting it from the relationship. You're coming in grateful for whatever opportunity that can come about from this relationship with your mentor, and you make the most out of it. But I just want to say that our goal is about how do we get your foot in the door? How can we help you effectively make those relationships happen and get the ball rolling for you? So to get credit for attendance during this workshop, I'll be asking you three questions throughout the workshop for you to answer and post your answers to these questions in the comment sections um, within 24 hours of this video going live. So if you're watching the Sunday night episode of this workshop, I'll expect you to have your comments made, your answers to the questions that we post uh, by 8 p.m. on Monday. If you're watching the Monday night version, I'll expect your answers to be posted um, by 8 p.m. on Tuesday. And if you're watching the Tuesday version of this workshop, I'm expecting your answers to be posted by Wednesday at 8 p.m. After that, you will not get credit. Now, I'm not looking for a comment like, hey, my name is John Doe. I'm just checking in. That won't get you credit. I'm going to ask you specific questions during the workshop that I'm going to point out and say, hey, post your answer to this question below in the comment section. That's how I know that you will be watching, paying attention, and are engaged in the workshop. So I want to set proper expectations. This program will not guarantee you an internship. It will not guarantee you a job, getting promoted faster than your peers. Having that mindset will not lead to proper results. This is not a program that hands things on a silver platter. These are for students. This program is for students that want to take their career path and their, their career into the next level, to their college experience to the next level, because that's absolutely what this program can do for you. If you think like, hey, I'm going to sit back, do the bare bones minimum, not really like apply myself, you know, you're going to get the outcome that you put into it. But if you really apply yourself, you absolutely can get the, the, the outcomes that you want. I mean, I like to think about it as the law of attraction. If you come in expecting negativity, you will get negativity. If you're open to the positive, you will achieve positive outcomes. You will attract positivity to what you want to achieve. So I really want to encourage you to come in with an open mind and a positive outlook for what you can achieve and the willingness to work hard towards getting there. Um, Students who have gone through this program have landed jobs at places like Google and other Silicon Valley companies, Wall Street investment banks, prestigious PR and marketing firms, and major engineering firms. Absolutely, yes. That has happened many times for many students. But did those outcomes get handed to them on a silver platter? Absolutely not. It's all about what you put into this program and the outcomes that you can achieve. They absolutely are there. They are absolutely possible. You have no idea how this can come about and, and help you out in terms of, of your mentor. Treat this program as fuel to help you get to where you want to be. If you're already burning and going strong, this program can really help you accelerate. Imagine just like getting dumped a bunch of gasoline on your big fire that you're already building. Um, if you're burning barely at an ember, let this program be a, a, a sliding point, a starting point for you to launch off. But if you think and you come in with the mentality that, hey, I'm, you know, I'm kind of doing a couple things, but I'm kind of following the status quo of like, I just go to the annual career fairs and I, you know, I apply on the online website and that's pretty much it. If you're coming in with that mentality and that you're not going to try to or be willing to open up and apply and, and do other things to help you get your foot in the door, this program you may struggle with because we're going to teach you a lot of things and a lot of ways that you can go about getting your foot in the door and getting opportunities for yourself that are not the normal way. That's why this program is for the students that are really interested in taking their life, their career to the next level because these are the, these are the tips that you are not taught in school and the experts that we bring in, the guests that we bring in, 
to these workshops have content, insight, and wisdom that they've, they've utilized and explained with it to within their books, within um, articles, within other pieces of content they, they've created that they've built an expertise on. And so the point I'm, all I'm making is that this program, if you're interested in taking your life, your career, your college experience to the next level, you are in the right place. So I'm really excited to get started. Now, a couple of keynotes about mentorship. Now, when it comes to your mentor and who you were matched with, one thing that we leveraged extensively is this research called work orientation, which is how you view your work. So some people view their work as a job. Some people view their work as a career. Some people view their work as a calling. Imagine a triangle and imagine it being a spectrum that can change throughout your life. So after you take your assessment and after you get matched with your mentor and you log into your dashboard, you can actually see your work orientation and your paired mentor's work orientation, which is really cool. Because what we've learned is when work orientation is aligned for a mentoring relationship, the likelihood that that relationship lasts for the full six months is considered both productive and quality by both participants increases by 400%. It's crazy how powerful work orientation is when it comes to mentor matching. If we were just to match you based on your career interest or their status within their company or their area of expertise, we know that those are only transactional metrics and the likelihood that that relationship will last for the full six months to be considered both productive and quality is low because then there's an expectation that someone's going to give you something or that you're going to give them something and that's ultimately not how successful mentorship works. Successful mentorship works when both people can, on a human level, invest in each other and that's how we make the matches happen. The other key thing about mentorship is vulnerability. The willingness to open up about who you are and what you want to accomplish in your story. I know that when you are more vulnerable, you are much more likely to build trust. You cannot build trust unless you've got vulnerability first. And it's up to you or your mentor to be the first person to take that step. So I want to challenge you to be the first person to take that step to be vulnerable first. And to give you an idea of what vulnerability looks like, I will share with you my story. Now, I'm, I'm passionate about mentorship. I'm passionate about mentorship because I needed mentors in my life. Um, from age 15 to age 19, I was a drug dealer. And at the end of my freshman year at Indiana University, I got arrested in an undercover operation by the Indiana University Police Department. And I got five felony distribution charges. I was expelled from school and I had no idea what I was going to do with my life. And I mean, that just, that hit me like a brick wall. I mean, up, up to that point in time in life, I thought success was you go to school, you get good grades, you get a job. And then somewhere along those lines, you find yourself like as if it were puberty, it would just come to me, but um, that's not how life works. And I had to learn that the hard way. Um, Cause no one who I had known, no, no one who I had ever known that I ever thought was successful ever was a drug dealer. Um, and so I had to accept either being a total failure or redefine my definition of success. And so I chose the latter. So I, I ended up enrolling in a program in, in St. George, Utah um, to help me turn my life around. And that's, that's where I really got exposed to the power of mentorship, both on a personal level and a professional level on a personal level, really having personal mentors, people that are there for you are, are so powerful. I really want to, I don't want to ever discredit that because I feel like sometimes when we're here and we're thinking about our professional outcomes, we don't realize how valuable mentors can be on our, on our personal level and really what they can do for us. Because if they help you open your mind to what you can accomplish in your career or what you can accomplish as a person and in who you can emulate your life after, they can really show you something that you didn't actually even believe in yourself that you could accomplish. And I think that's so powerful. And that's really what they did for me. But on a professional level, they helped me really come to the grips with the fact that when you Google search my name when I was 19 years old, the first thing you saw was IUPD does drug sweeps for eight. And I'm one of the eight. I mean, <laughs> there could not have been a bigger red X across my name when applying for any role. I mean, could you imagine that? Literally, any role I would apply for, I would have showed up with a big red flag. That is bad. So I, about a month after living in Utah, I flew back to Chicago. That's where my family's from for the weekend to let them know my life's getting on track. On that flight, I'm sitting next to a guy. We start talking. He starts sharing with me about his life. I start sharing with him about my life. We hit it off. I just, I take a keen interest in him. I'm actively listening. I'm sharing. I'm, I'm really trying to put myself into his shoes. And I'm really, most importantly, actively listening. I'm taking down notes. I'm following up on the things that he has to say. I'm really digging into his world because he loves to talk about himself. And I'm really playing into that. Well, it turns out he's the director of ground equipment for SkyWest Airlines. 
And by the time that that plane lands, he offers me an internship on the spot doing financial analysis for SkyWest Airlines. Boom, like right on the spot. What an amazing experience. I mean, he took me under his wing. He didn't care about my background. He didn't care about what I had gone through or where I was going or the fact that I may even go to prison sometime in the next year. He took me under his wing and gave me a shot. And that was huge. And that's really where the whole idea for Ambition Emotion came from was how, like the fact that opportunities could come out of the blue, that they didn't come from just applying on a website and people putting your resume in a background check system and that, you know, maybe you get spit out with this opportunity. I learned that opportunities could come from just putting myself out there, being vulnerable and taking a keen interest in somebody else and actively listening to them. And so I think that's a, such an important story to share with you because it, one, it shows, I mean, my vulnerability, but two, it shows that opportunities can come from a wide array of places and it doesn't matter where you're coming from. It matters where you're going. And if you believe that you can achieve what you want to achieve, you absolutely can achieve it, but you have to put in the work to go and get there and you have to be willing to be vulnerable with people. Don't hold all your failures, your mistakes close to the chest because you think people will judge you. Put them out into the world because ultimately people will give you opportunities and they will believe in you if you let them. So that's something that's extremely important and extremely helpful for this workshop that I really wanted to share with you. So now that I've shared my story with you, I am excited for you to embark on your mentor relationship. And I hope that me being vulnerable with you, maybe it inspired you to be vulnerable with your mentor. Hopefully it gave you the confidence to be be comfortable with your mentor and at minimum it just hopefully it just gave you the, the confidence to be comfortable with yourself and who you are and where you want to be and where you're going now for this mentor program there are three keys to success in this program that is honing your strategy your story and your state now I said those in reverse order of importance and I'm going to elaborate a little bit about why each one of these are so important in terms of being successful in this program in terms of your story or sorry in terms of your state your state is your physical being, your physiology. Like, how are you physically right now? Are you like in a peak state? Are you ready to go? Are you jumped up, pumped up, ready to jam? Are you coming into this mentor meeting like, man, I'm about to take on the world and I'm ready to go. I'm excited. I'm amped up. Or are you hunched over? Are you in a bad body language, bad posture, in a bad mood? Something bad happened during the day. I'm, you're tired, exhausted, stressed out, whatever. If you're coming in with a negative state, I can promise you, you're gonna have a bad relationship. Your first impression is everything. Your first impression is everything. If you come in in a negative attitude because you've had a bad day, I can promise you, the relationship is not going to get off to where you want it to be. But if you come in with high energy, you come in like, hey, I'm pumped, I'm excited to learn from you, I'm excited to learn your story, I'm excited to ask you questions, I'm excited to, to share knowledge with you and, and have you ask me questions, I'm excited for this relationship to begin. If you come in with that mentality, you will have a great and positive first impression. Now, there's a couple ways that you can go about doing this. One way and my favorite way to go about getting yourself into a peak state, into a peak state physiologically, is to get up, shake it loose, and yell at the top of your lung. I know the lungs. I know it sounds crazy to do something like this, but I want you to do it right now while you're watching this video. I don't care if you're in your dorm room. I don't care if you're in your house. I don't care where you're at. I want you to stand up and I want you to shake it loose. I want you to shimmy. I want you to let it go. I want you to scream at the top of your lungs. Just go, yeah, just let it loose. Let it out. Let it go. Because here's the thing. When you do this, you're releasing endorphins in your brain that make you feel excited, that make you feel energized, that make you feel good, that make you feel confident, that make you feel like I am here and ready to take on the world. And when you do this, you get yourself into a state ready to be in a good mood, to be in a good, to leave a good impression. So I don't care what's going on with your world. If you get your, in, yourself into a state physiologically conducive to being successful, get your body language on point, you are going to be successful. Promises on that. The next key is your story. So what is the story that you tell yourself? If you tell yourself a story like, oh man, I'm an introvert, so I couldn't possibly be good at networking, or I couldn't possibly be good at socializing or being around other people. Or if you tell yourself, I'm an extrovert, I'm crazy around people, I can't even handle it right now, I'm nuts. Can't even, I, can't, you know, I can't even contain myself when I'm around people, I'm just like a blabbermouth, I have word vomit, I just let things fly like crazy. Um, if you tell yourself these stories for why you will or won't be successful, 
that will become a self-fulfilling prophecy. So back to what I was talking about when I said the law of attraction, if you believe that you can be good at something, you will be good at something. I promise you that. But the key is you have to believe it. And the second thing is you have to practice it because networking is a skill like shooting a basketball or knitting a quilt. The more you practice, the better you get. So if you think, oh man, I'm an introvert and, or I'm an extrovert, which makes me bad at networking, you're not gonna practice networking, which is going to reinforce you being bad at networking. But if you work at it, if you practice, if you use this mentor program to meet with your mentor, someone who's got like of no consequence to you, like if you, God forbid, mess up this relationship with your mentor, what is the worst that happens? This was a total stranger that you've never met before this moment. Now all of a sudden you're building this relationship. Why not give it a shot? Because here's the thing, if it ends up working out great, it gives you the confidence to start reaching out to more people and building a better rapport with more people and building your network. And then all of a sudden you can become better at networking. You can become better at building relationships with other people. And you can be better at learning opportunities when they arise and getting your foot in the door. So the point I'm making here is what is the story you tell yourself? What is the thing that you've got in your mind for why you will or will not be successful? And the key here is that if you do have something positive in your mind, I promise you, you are going to be much more likely to manifest that outcome for yourself. And the last key is the strategy. So what are the strategies that you are going to leverage to help you getting your foot in the door for an opportunity? Now, here's something that I like to do. I like to implement new routines every single month because what it does is it helps me get into that pop, into powerful habits. Now, some of them stick, some of them don't stick. Some of them take you know, a while to stick. Some of them take practice and that's okay. But the key is that you have to start. And so one thing that I would love for you to start doing in terms of a strategy to help you build a strong routine that will help you start getting your foot in the door is the one, if you don't have a LinkedIn profile account, get a LinkedIn profile account. LinkedIn is a powerful tool. It's so powerful. But then once you've gotten a LinkedIn profile account, I want you to connect with 10 new people in your field, not just 10 new friends or whatever. If you're just starting your LinkedIn account, Friend request everybody, get as many as you can. In fact, you should really try to get above 500 plus LinkedIn connections because once you're there, you are much more in the LinkedIn algorithm likely to get recommended by other people in terms of connecting with them. But more importantly, I want you to take, connect with 10 new people in your field of interest. So if you want to get into banking, connect with 10 bankers. If you want to get in the marketing, connect with 10 marketers. If you want to get into engineering, connect with 10 engineers. Connect with 10 new people every single week. And it's a really easy thing to do. Send them a personalized message, say, hey, Jane Doe, I'm a student studying XYZ category. I'm really interested in your work and I'm interested in potentially pursuing a career in this path. I would love to connect and maybe learn a little bit more about your work, you know, your name. It's the simplest message. And in fact, if you go on the tips and templates tab on the AIM dashboard, you can actually see a copy and pasteable link that you can literally copy and paste to help you send this message out to other professionals on LinkedIn. But if you can get into the habit of sending 10 new people a connection request, every single week, I promise you, you are going to start meeting with some of these people and this could open up doors that maybe weren't even there or you didn't even realize were possible. I strongly encourage that. 70% of all job offers go to somebody who knows somebody at that company, not from just applying blindly on a college career website. I promise you that. 70% of jobs go to someone who knows someone at that company. So if you can build relationships with somebody at that company, your resume will go to the top because you were a referral not a random stranger who applied. Build your network. So one thing that I love to do, and by the way, we're about to get started into our guest speaker, but one thing that I love to do before, to, to really reinforce what we're talking about, one thing that we've learned is teaching something to somebody else. So think about something that you've learned within these first few minutes of this workshop so far, or something that you will learn through our guest speaker in this workshop. I want you to think about that and I want, to, I want you to teach it to somebody else. Something that you learn. And the reason why this is so powerful is because, you know, learning something in a workshop is amazing. I mean, sure, I'm on here, I'm on this video and that's great, that's all, that's amazing, that's fine and dandy. But if you go back to bed or if you, you know, you're like, oh, that was cool, I kind of took a note, whatever, like that might stick, but the likelihood that it actually sticks increases exponentially when you teach it to somebody else. So find a friend, find a stranger, find somebody and teach them something that you learned this evening. And I promise you, it will reinforce substantially more in your brain. You are much more likely to adopt the habits that you are learning. You're much more likely to apply the skills that you are gaining. So that is the key thing that I really want to stress with you from this workshop. So I'm really excited 
to jump into our guest speaker because we've got a great one for you this evening. I'm excited to learn. I'm excited for you to learn from our guest. Welcome to our workshop this evening. I'm so excited to dive into this topic of how to get our foot in the door. How can we go about putting yourself in the right position to meet the right people that might be able to help us land maybe an internship, maybe a job, maybe a great introduction that can help us get into our graduate program of choice, or just really people that can help guide us and mentor us in our career as we move forward. We've got an incredible guest speaker with us today, or, or just really a guest that, to share his perspective on how he's gotten his foot in the door for professional opportunities and just, you know, suggestions for students on, on how they can get their foot in the door for opportunity as well. We've got Chris Jasinski with us. Chris is the Director of Marketing for Union Studio, Studio in Providence, Rhode Island, where Chris combines his love for design and branding to highlight the human connections, human connections with buildings and spaces created by architects and designers. Chris currently serves as vice chair for the ACE Mentor Program of Rhode Island and was a board member for AIA Cleveland prior to moving to the East Coast. Chris uses his skills and experiences to think of unconventional marketing approaches to the architecture industry and executes exceptional ideas with great attention to detail. Chris, thanks for being here. Thank you. That sounds a lot better when you uh, read it out loud. So I appreciate it. Thanks for the intro. Yeah, of course, of course. I mean, the the intro always sounds better when you've got a, a hype man pumping yeah. you up. Um, yeah. But Chris, thanks for being here. I'm I'm so excited. So I I think maybe to begin, how did you get into your first job, and then how did that transition into you getting to where you're at today? Because I know you've had you know a couple of jobs after you graduated college, and and that would require some level of getting your foot in the door to see where those opportunities take you. So how, how did you go about accomplishing what you've accomplished so far in your life and career? Yeah, so um, I think it was my, I was going into my senior year of college um, in undergrad and I realized that I wanted to uh, make a shift into what I was pursuing a degree in. So I added a second bachelor's degree in interior design. Um, and a lot of people were like, well, why are you staying in school for three more years? And I knew I wanted to, do something other than just my communications degree. And so I pursued that degree, finished up and, you know, it was, it was kind of hard and I graduated in 2010 and it was a little difficult to find a job also in Cleveland. You know, there's some great firms, a firm that I worked at later on. Um, but it was, it was a little difficult to get uh, a job immediately. So I lived with my parents after graduating. Um, and that was probably like, seven, seven months, I think. Um, and through that time, I literally just spent my days like going to thrift stores, flipping stuff and applying for jobs. That was like my two passions. I was like, I was flipping stuff on eBay and filling out job applications, always fine tuning my resume and trying to look up other people's resumes online, going on, you know, graphic design platforms like Behance and seeing how people are presenting themselves. So I really spent that time and was almost waiting for the, like the right opportunity. I didn't want to take a job as my first job that I knew I would probably be unhappy with, like doing sales and nothing against sales. I have friends that do it and they love it, but I know I'm not meant, out, you know, meant to do that. So um, I just kind of was waiting for the right opportunity while like not just sitting and waiting for it to come to me, but waiting to pursue the right opportunity, I guess you could say. Um, so it kind of happened to have a little bit of luck. Uh, my dad, he was a, uh, retired and he was working at a car museum just to kind of kill time. And a woman that was working there, she was leaving the museum to go work for her father's architecture firm. So he said, oh, my son just graduated with a degree in interior design. And she said, oh, send him my way and I'll meet with them. So I met with uh, this woman, Kim Fleischman, who I still am in contact with today. Uh, and met with her, met with her dad, Richard Fleischman, who was the owner of the firm. Um, he was in his 80s at the time. And uh, they gave me my first opportunity as a as a marketing coordinator. So, wow. Yeah, that's so crazy. I mean, that's just the power of leveraging your network. I mean, shoot, I would imagine a lot of students watching this right now are thinking to themselves, they've got a family friend, they've got a parent, they've got a 
cousin, nephew, uncle, brother that says, oh, you need to meet this person. You're thinking to yourself like, oh, great. Who are they going to introduce me to? Like, yeah, yeah. why are we even meeting? I don't even think we should do it. I think um, one of the things I hear from a lot of students is, oh, I want to wait for the perfect time to meet with him. I don't want to, I don't want to waste my, you know, one shot at meeting with this person on this right now, because I don't know if I'm in the right state for it. I don't know if I have enough uh, clout to meet with them. I, I know I met with uh, a young woman who is a writer and she, you know, when, when connecting her with, um, with a, a journalist um, at a major, major periodical, um, she was like, oh, well, I don't know if I should meet with them quite yet. Like, I don't know if it makes sense. Like, I haven't published enough articles. Like, I don't know if it makes sense for me to do that. And I'm like, hey, Rachel, just go. Just yeah, meet with them. Like, you got nothing to lose. You are a college student. He's not expecting you to be this world renowned author by the time that you and him are connecting, you're not on the same level and they're, it's cool. He's not expecting you to be. Um, so I love how you just dove right in and, and said, okay, I'm gonna meet with this person and I've got no expectations, but we'll see where that goes. Yeah, so I, I sent her my resume and I can't remember how long it took to hear back from her. Um, Cause I mean, you have somebody that's leaving their own career transitioning to a firm that her father started so it wasn't like, hey, this week come in as she was moving it, you know, it took some time. So, but I just kept following up uh, with her and then went in and met with them. And there was a lot of great Cleveland architects that have come through that office. It's almost like a, a training, if you will, like old school architecture. It was a really great first environment, I think, to be in. Um, it taught me a lot. It, you know, really, I think was kind of helped shape how I am the way I am today in my career. Um, so it was a great first experience and I'm glad I kind of waited for that and sought out that right opportunity. Um, Real quick, you talked about following up. I think that's a really important thing to touch on for students. I think sometimes students, we might think like, oh, well, I sent them my resume. They never followed up. Like, I guess we're, uh, I, I guess they're not interested. I don't really know. Um, how many times did you follow up with Kim? I would say probably it was, you know, over 10 years ago now. So it was probably like three, three to four times. And then even at uh, a recent position before we're at Union Studio at Vocon, um, you know, I followed up with them and then I was getting offered to go to another firm and I really wanted to go to Vocon because they just, I really liked the work that they were doing. It was kind of the culture and size of a firm that I wanted to kind of move and try, you know, try my hand at. So I kind of was having to follow up and communicate because they were, you know, growing as a firm. And so every position I've had, it's about follow-up even with Union Studio. Um, and I think it's also follow-up, you know, we can probably touch on this, but I don't want to jump ahead, but the interview process, I always write a handwritten note um, after interviews, after I meet with somebody. Um, when I've done photo shoots in my career as like director of marketing, I write thank you notes to people that were helpful on the photo shoot, whether it's like a maintenance worker at a facility or something. So I think communication and follow-up is probably one of the best pieces of advice I can give to somebody. And it sounds cliche or easy, but a lot of people surprisingly don't do it. Um, and you wouldn't believe kind of the, the power that a simple handwritten note, you know, not typed up and not in an email and mailed or dropped off in person can have. So. Yeah, I think that's, so you brought up a couple of things. One, three to four times. Students, listen to that. If you send your resume into somewhere and you don't hear back, send them a follow-up, send them another follow-up, send them another follow -up. Like, it's okay to be persistent because at the end of the day, you are the one that's not annoying. If if you were asked to send in a resume, I think it, it's, it's your, I don't want to say it's your right, but I mean, you deserve to get a response. Like you should be able to hear back. And even if it means you follow up multiple times, eventually they're going to get back to you, but you shouldn't just chalk it up to, I sent my resume in, they never followed up and uh, say la vie. It should be persistent because those that are persistent are, persistent are going to be the ones that garner the opportunities. Um, but also to your point, Chris, I love that you talked about the handwritten note. I think that is such an underutilized tip and trick for just making a positive impact on somebody because nobody sends in handwritten notes. Yeah, no, um, there was a guy that I worked for um, at, a, at a company and he told me that he does it. He sends it to clients. He sends and he's like, you know, 
uh, one of the principals of the firm. So I just thought it was a, a nice touch. Um, and when I moved to Providence where I am now, I sent handwritten notes to the people that tried to connect me with, you know, different people at different firms and stuff like that. So I, I just think it's a nice touch. People remember it, you know, whether it brings you value immediately or five years from now, I think it's just a night. It's everybody talks about building your own brand, um, your personal brand. And I, I think that's an important just piece of it. That's really easy to do. So totally. And I think, yeah, I mean, even if your handwriting sloppy, my handwriting super sloppy, I am a total testament to the handwritten note. I mean, my, my handwriting is barely like legible. It's like chicken scratch. But the fact that I made the effort and I've made the effort in similar scenarios has been totally positive. I don't know what your handwriting is like, like, Chris. I just know I'm thinking of the potential obstacle students have said to me of why not do it. And I'm like, still shouldn't be an excuse. Do it anyways. Yeah, I would just practice, get some old uh, paper like in grade school and start practicing again um, or something. But yeah, no, it's it just goes a long way. So so you kind of touched on this, but I'd love to ask, like, did you ever struggle to get a role? So, I mean, you, you mentioned you, you lived with your parents for seven months after graduation, which, by the way, I appreciate you sharing that. I think it's, you know, it's for everybody works on their own path. And I think everybody's working on their own scenario. And I, and I appreciate your willingness to wait for the right role to come your way and for you to essentially pursue um, versus just taking, like you had said, that's a first sales job, not to say anything against sales, but for you, obviously it wasn't the right fit. Yeah. But did you ever have a scenario in that seven month period where you were applying for roles that you knew you were well, well qualified for, but you weren't getting the result you were looking for? Um, I'm sure at the time I, you know, probably would like read a job description on LinkedIn or Indeed or something. Think to myself, like, how come I'm not even getting an email back or, you know, but now I guess if you, if I could fast forward to myself now and talk to my old self, um, I would say just not to worry about it and don't, don't dwell on it um, and kind of just keep focus on the other opportunities or um, that maybe you could pursue. Something will come up, you know, and I don't think, I'm not a person that wants to settle in anything um, in life, in my personal life and professional life. So, you know, I, I would just encourage students to kind of keep focus on it and don't, because if you just keep focusing on how many responses you don't get, you're, it's going to take you away from, you know, reviewing your resume or your portfolio and improving and wanting to grow. I mean, I have a bunch of books in my office that I'm like always reading and it's stuff I know, but it's just nice to get another perspective. I think it's like, I have all of Gary V's books and, you know, Ryan Serhant from Million Dollar Listing. I'm not a real estate agent, but I find the way he does things to be really engaging and exciting. And I'm going to try to take what I can from that. So um, yeah, I would just say, don't, don't dwell on it. You know, that's sounds easy, but when you definitely need a job too, because everybody might not have parents that they can live with. Um, so that's kind of why you just kind of have to keep focus and like, that's why I was flipping stuff, going to flea markets every weekend, going to thrift stores, doing all this stuff. And that it's funny to see like Gary V who runs like a multi-million dollar company or multiple companies. He's doing that. It's like a passion of it. So try to find like a side hustle that you like doing. You know, if you're going to school for architecture, see if you can connect with like an individual like architect to help them with drawings or something. And just, you know, any kind of side hustle, whether it's like graphic design or a separate passion from the industry. If you like, you know, baking, go to like a flea market and sell your baked goods or something. I don't know. So I would just say, keep focused. I'm rambling about different opportunities that people could do, but I think it's important that you kind of do what makes you happy. I'm a big believer in that. Yeah, no, that's cool. That makes sense. Um, so how do you get your foot in the door? How, how do you go about actively doing that now? I mean, I know that with COVID happening, a lot of students have to resort to potentially even virtual means like LinkedIn or email or even phone calls, but what do you, what did you do to get your foot in the door and how would you suggest students go about getting their foot in the door for opportunities? Yeah. So after my first job, um, to go from, uh, Richard Fleischman Architects to Bocon. That was through like industry events and networking. I met a woman that worked there and became friends with her at just events, you know, grabbing drinks at, um, you know, industry happy hours like AIA or, you know, every industry has a organization that you can become a student member of. Um, I know for AIA, for architects, it's, I think it's free for students. Um, 
And so start signing up for your local chapter for those, whether it's engineering, graphic design, any of those, and start going to those events once events start happening. Um, sign up for their newsletters online. Since things are virtual, you can see different workshops. And you know, I know people in our office, we've been doing some panel discussions virtually with different organizations, just be in attendance, follow up with people on LinkedIn that you see that are in attendance on those you know, virtual panel discussions. I think it definitely is easier once you're in person and you can make real connections with people because they can get a sense of who you are. Um, but I would say um, just to try to build, I was talking with a business development director from a large construction company the other week, and we were talking about human relationships, like personal relationships is, and development of those relationships is so much more important than just typical business development. Um, in this case, for students, your business development is getting a job um, instead of getting a project for your construction company or engineering company or architecture firm. Um, so human, human connection, human relationships, being a real person with somebody and trying to connect with someone based on maybe something you see that they post on LinkedIn, um, you know, post, follow, find their Instagram handles. A lot of principals, hiring managers, pe everyday people, you know, I'm on Instagram and mine's kind of like a personal insight, but also professional. Um, there's tons of people in industries that have those types of accounts. So follow them, connect with them, comment, but don't always just, don't go in asking for something. I, I think that's where a lot of people make mistakes and that's not even just about students getting a job. I think that's in professional industry. So many times I'll go on my LinkedIn feed and just see people like asking for something immediately. And I like hit my head every time. I'm like, how are people still doing this and trying to build a relationship this way? Everybody sees through the sales emails that come through. So yeah, being, being yourself, being a, a real person that somebody can want to go grab a drink with or have in their office as had a, you know, company event and they can see you there. I think that uh, is really helpful. So, yeah, I think that's really interesting. So one, you knew after you had that job in architecture, you're like, I love architecture. I want to stay in architecture. Yeah. So I, you know, as I said, I had a degree in communications and a degree in interior design, and I really started enjoying the branding element of what we were doing. Um, storytelling of our firm, how do we get projects, how do we tell the story of projects and clients and their stories um, through photography, video. So I just really kind of went all in um, on that and never, never looked back, never pursued doing, you know, a design of an office space. And I've chimed in with some project teams over the years, like um, some branding elements on like a wall here or there, but um, yeah, it's just, it's not something that I was super passionate about anymore once I saw another thing. So I think that's also important that you can shift and, you know, it's, you don't have to be stuck in this one, you know, path or this one thing. Um, I think that's with companies too, right? They don't need to just stay in one lane to do something over and over again. I think it's important to adapt. Um, and it's definitely how people are building connections is definitely adapting or evolving as as we've gone through this past year so well you know what's interesting is is well i love that you brought up the idea of adapting and pivoting and iterating i mean i would imagine there's a lot of students that are studying one degree field maybe they're in marketing maybe they're in mechanical engineering maybe they're in finance and maybe they're thinking like okay i have an idea a construct as to what a traditional career looks like in this space but i don't actually know what industry to pursue within that um and so a lot of them choose not to go to those industry events and i think one of the the messages that you know maybe you're kind of subtly saying is people are starved for social interaction right now especially coming out of covid but one and two they're starved for meeting students at these events i mean there are so few students that come to a lot of these industry-wide events. Why? Because maybe a student hasn't decided they want to get into architecture yet, or they haven't decided they want to get into, into uh, uh, you know, civil engineering firm or a construction firm, or they haven't decided they want to get into a bank or whatever form of industry they want to get into. And so they choose not to join those industry-related um, organizations. But if you can go, like you had said, Chris, most time, most of the time they are free for students to attend and join. 
um, one and two, it's a great way to meet other people, especially if very few other students are going because if very few other students are going, you are going to stand out. People are going to want to interact with you because they're going to be genuinely curious as to why you are there while so many other students aren't. And that's going to increase your attraction. Once other people are there, you diminish your kind of uniqueness in the group. Yeah, no, there's, um, it reminds me, there's this one guy that he was uh, going to a local university in Cleveland and he just got really involved with the AIA chapters and his city and then Cleveland was a neighboring one. It was Akron and Cleveland, they each have chapters. And he just was always involved, always at events. And then when it came time for like student scholarships or awards, like AIA, the Cleveland chapter would recognize that. Um, he would speak on panels as the senior in college and stuff. And he, him and his firm that he's at, they do great work. And it's just, he's kind of how, if I could go back and tell myself to do that when I was in school, instead of like waiting till it was over, I would 100% do that model because it's just, it, it's a foolproof way to make a connection with somebody when you can actually get to know somebody and then you do email them about an opportunity. A lot of times firms might not even promote their opportunities they have online. So if you're just waiting for a job posting on LinkedIn, you know, it might not come. So you could find and target a person or a principal or a, you know, project director, or anybody at a firm. Um, it doesn't need to be, you know, their HR director and you build a relationship with them and they'll make it happen. If, if you kind of build the right connection and can offer that you'd be a good fit with them. So. Yeah, I think I was reading a statistic that like 70% of all jobs are acquired through somebody who knows somebody else at that company. Like only 30% are done through the actual formal online job posting sort of thing. So it pays to know people. Yeah, I've never, I've never had a job that I didn't know somebody at in some way. And that goes all the way back to high school working at a gas station. The, the like lady that worked at the gas station was my neighbor. And so I just I needed a job in high school and that was like my first job and then so it's just you know I, I think utilize everybody you can you don't want to use people you don't want to come off as that way you yeah I don't want to keep hammering home building relationships but you never know where an opportunity can come from and the thing with the organizations too is don't just show up to the events get involved with organizations uh, AIA um, the ACE Mentor Program, I'm on the board here for the Rhode Island chapter. We always are like needing help, you know, for we have our big fundraiser coming up this year or this week. And it would be awesome if there was like more hands on deck to help with that. And I know AIA Cleveland brings on a student um, like intern almost to help with events and, you know, des graphic design stuff or marketing that they need to do. And every intern they've had goes on to get a job they're connected with you know people in the industry and not to say it's only because of their involvement there but it is very helpful you know for somebody to see you at these things yeah so I would love to ask the students a question real quick and that is what is an industry association that you would like to join and actually you know what let's make a commitment out of this what's an industry association that you're going to join tonight after this workshop to potentially start networking and meeting other people um so maybe learn about opportunities that you didn't realize existed. Post in the comment section. I love to learn about it. Um, but yeah, it makes me think of another interesting idea. This is what somebody had shared with me one time that I thought was fascinating. It, somebody I met with had shared with me that when, when he goes to networking events, he does not go with friends. And I always found it very fascinating. What, what he had said was that every time that he goes with a friend, he always whether that he feels compelled to chat with his friend or his fr friend feels compelled to chat with him, he's less open to building social connections because he is kind of like in his head about like, well, who else do I know here? But when he goes in and knows nobody, he's so much more likely to become a social butterfly and open up and meet other people. What are your thoughts on that, Chris? Um, I think I, I would say you have to do what's right for you, right? If you're going to have a panic attack at the front door of an event and you're not going to even be able to go in, then don't do it. Um, I also am, you know, I kind of struggle with that, just being 100% honest uh, with everybody. I, when I moved here to Providence um, with my wife, then it was my um, 
we were just dating at the time we weren't married and it was design week for Rhode Island. It was Rhode Island design week. And they had different conferences, like conferences, lectures, different talks at, you know, different venues. And there was one that was by an architect talking about, um, school design that they were doing in New York. And I was like, oh, that just seems like a really cool thing. And my wife, she was working and I was like, all right, well, I guess I'm just going to go because I didn't know anybody. And I know her sister that, you know, it has nothing to do with, she's an accountant. She doesn't care about that. I'm not going to make her go with me. So I just went by myself. And, you know, and when you start, when you come from an area or you move to a different city that you really have to start over with your network, which is kind of what I had to do, you do have to put yourself out there in some way. Um, I was lucky that I kind of connected with one person through um, a colleague of mine, and then they connected me to a group that got together on a monthly basis of like six people, and then that started growing. So it just, you have, you never know where a connection can come from, and you do kind of have to put yourself out there. If it is helpful for you to go with one colleague or a coworker or student, uh, you know, a classmate, go with one person, but you definitely, yeah, don't want to be just the two people standing uh, in a corner at, you know, at an event by themselves, you got to put yourself out there a little bit. So. Totally. I think I was just playing off of that, uh, that idea of when you go to an event, you don't like, I I've gone to events and I've brought students before and, um, you know, you're at the event and, you know, I, and maybe a couple people are, uh, of the students are out there chatting, meeting with new people. And you got other students that are just kind of like clumped up in a corner, not talking to anybody on their phone, just kind of like saying, technically I came to this event. And it's like, cool, but you're not actually meeting anybody. Did you chat with anybody you didn't know before this evening and have an in-depth conversation? And so I feel like there's a lot of missed opportunities when, um, when, yeah, we, we are, when we have those people that we know that are at an event. So I think if you do go with a friend, like, which I think totally, it obviously depends on yourself, really focus with the goal of meeting new people and, and connecting with them and, and that sort of, sort of thing. Um, yeah. So like, even if you, even if you go there, just say, Hey, we're going to split off for 15 minutes or something and then come back to each other or something, you know? So I just think you have to find what works for you. Um, and I think too, as we start having more events, people are definitely, I think there will be a shift of how open people are at events. I think people are genuinely have probably missed human connection throughout the past year and a half. So um, yeah, R rip yeah. off the bandaid and go to some events, I guess. So. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, that makes a lot of sense. Um, let's talk about LinkedIn for a moment. How do you use LinkedIn? How do you think students could use LinkedIn to help them get their foot in the door for professional opportunities? Yeah, so um, I think LinkedIn is, you know, very interesting. I think it has a great targeted reach and a lot of people, um, they still think, oh, it's just a place I'm putting my job qualifications and, and that's it. And I hear that so much. And, you know, my, my wife, she didn't, she's a clinical psychologist and has lots of articles that she wrote in grad school and she didn't have a LinkedIn. I'm like, this is a great way for people to find you as a psychologist. Like, you know, like she's also on other platforms that are tailored towards that. But um, I think people util that don't utilize it and don't know um, how it can be used, you know, they don't see the value in that. But by just following different companies that you like, by the business development director uh, for the construction company that I've built a good relationship with, him and I, we probably had a hour and a half conversation like last week just catching up seeing how each other's doing I've never sent him a proposal of any kind he's never sent me a proposal or a marketing package of their company to bring them on as a construction company and it would be weird almost if we were to do that and we were talking about LinkedIn because he's very active on it um, and he's encouraged me to get more and more active on it but he'll just comment on people like hey this looks great I love what you're doing for this city uh, if it's a town planner or something, or if it's an architect, like just comp being complimentary, being available for somebody, like, let me know if you have questions. It's never, Hey, look at my company and what we can do for you. Or if we can do your, you know, plumbing or your windows or doors, or like, it's never like a sales pitch. It's just complimentary. It's personable. Um, and he's gotten projects for his company that way by just a year of commenting on LinkedIn 
uh, somebody like, oh, wait, no, I know you, you always were very supportive of that article and you showed up to this town meeting or, you know, so there's a, a balance of virtual and personal um, in person development that needs to happen. Um, but LinkedIn, you know, I'd also encourage people to share their own articles, you know, you can write an article. I've only written one, which I have like probably seven in drafts on my uh, LinkedIn um, profile, but utilizing it to like be confident to put your own work out there, put out the work that you want to attract. Um, I have a graphic designer friend that has a great company that he self-employed for years. He always says like, he just puts out the work that he wants to do for clients. And early on, there was a few things that, you know, he had to do just to like, you know, pay bills and all that stuff. But as you start to develop, you'll kind of attract what you put out there and um, what you want to surround yourself with. So. Yeah, that makes sense. That's really, um, that's really interesting. I think you allude to the power of commenting on LinkedIn. Um, and so I don't know if for any students that are watching this, um, commenting on LinkedIn is huge because it really helps that post expand substantially. Like the, I don't know how the algorithm works, but anytime you get more comments on your post, your post goes much, much more, as much greater reach and much more people um, can see your comment. And so big, big advocate for commenting on other people's posts, because I think there's a lot of power in doing that. Um, and, and make it like valuable to that post. Don't just write great post or wow, that was great. Or something very simple that I see tons of people doing. Yeah. Um, just say something that you found interesting about it. Say a follow-up to something if they asked a question, you know, give them an answer, give them your opinion. If they asked a question, like just again, be a person, how you would interact with a friend or a family member having a conversation, utilize it that way. Um, I think it's super powerful. And yeah, the, as you just said, that the more people comment, the more people like it. And also other people can see as people are commenting and different things. It'll like, sometimes I'll discover posts that I find interesting just because somebody in my network, it'll say, John Smith commented on this post and I'll look at him like, oh, wow, that's interesting. And then I find myself reading the whole article. So definitely um, make yourself present on there and provide value any way you can, so. You know, I, um, I'd love to ask the students a question real quick. If you have a LinkedIn profile, um, and if you don't have a LinkedIn profile, I'd highly encourage you to start getting a LinkedIn profile immediately. Um, but if you do have a LinkedIn profile, I'd love to ask, how many posts can you commit to commenting on um, after this workshop this evening? And I know that sounds like a crazy thing to ask, but I love to know, like, okay, if you're learning about it, great, but are you applying it? Are you trying something? Go to a post by somebody, make a comment, make it intelligible, make it something meaningful. Um, how many of those can you commit to doing? Post in the comment section below. I love to love to see a commitment from you all in terms of something actionable, tangible that you can start doing on LinkedIn to start connecting with people. Um, but also on the topic of LinkedIn, I love to ask the question of just outreach and reaching out to people. I guess maybe the question within that is, one, do professionals like helping students? And two, if so, are they inclined to say yes to a student's connection request if they say, hey, I'm a student, I'd love to learn from you? Um, I, I would say I can speak for myself and say, yes, um, I reached out to the school I went to and then a teacher that was a professor that was there. Um, he, you know, was like so thrilled that I reached out to him and cause we were doing a scholarship, um, at our firm. And so he was, you know, a couple weeks went by and he said, Hey, I have a student here that I think would be great if they reached out there, they want to go into marketing, but also interior design and you're, that's exactly what you did. So, you know, can I connect you? And so I was like, yeah, have, have them reach out. So uh, the student reached out to me, you know, via email and we set up a time to have a chat and I talked to her probably for like an hour on the phone and just picking her brain, trying to give her good firms, you know, and she was deciding between two cities in Ohio where to go to. I was like, well, these ones I think are good in Cleveland for what you're looking to do. I'm not sure about Columbus. Here are some other ones I know of though that kind of fit that. So I am very eager to help somebody when I can, um, whether it's a phone call or in person, a, a lunch or something. So uh, I, I would think most people you know, would take the time to, to help you if they can. So don't, don't be afraid to reach out to somebody, but I will say kind of that contradicts my just asking somebody for something right off the top. So 
if you have if you have a connection somehow that can make that easier, that probably would help. But if a student just reached out to me directly, I wouldn't say no. Um, so I think that's where it's um, a little bit different for students and professionals of that ask immediately. And I don't think that's necessarily contradictory. I mean, I think like the point you brought up was like, don't come in thinking like, hey, you're going to offer me a job or an internship right off the bat. But you yeah, can come yeah. in asking a general like, hey, can I have an informational interview with you? Like, I'm a student. I'm interested in this path, but I don't actually know if this is the path I want to go down. Would you be open to having a conversation with me? That's yep. not asking. That's just asking for a conversation. That's easy. Yeah. Um, I, yeah. So I think that there's a big difference between like saying like, hey, Chris, can we have a conversation so I could talk about an internship at your company versus, hey, Chris, I'm a student. I'm aspiring to be in this space. I don't actually know if this is the space I want to be in, but I was hoping to have a 15 to 30 minute informational interview with you. Would you be open to having a conversation in the next month? Yep. Yeah. That's it's so much better. more, so much more approachable. Um, there's literally no zero burden on that person other than the time for the phone call. Right. So if somebody reached out to me and said, Hey, I want to intern at your firm. You guys do great work. I now have to like email our operations and HR person. I have to, do we even have room for it? Knowing that we probably don't because we already have interns lined up. So it's like a much more of a struggle there, not a struggle, but like there's more of a burden you're putting on that person. Whereas the other way that you said it is just, Hey, I just want to have a conversation and I have some questions and I value the work that you do and appreciate it. And I think I'd love your, you know, insight on your career or something. It's so much more um, digestible. So, and after you built that bond and rapport, that person may turn around and say, Hey, we actually have an internship program. We are actually seeking interns for this upcoming summer. I don't know what you're doing, but if you'd be interested in it, you know, here's our application process and, you know, you can go from there. Yeah, no, exactly. And the more you can, uh, yeah, have that relationship ready to go with different people and, you know, in various companies, it, you know, you never know who will be an advocate for you. Um, yeah. So I'd love to take a moment to ask the students a final question here, but what would you say your biggest takeaway has been from Chris so far? What, are, what has been, you know, what are the things that you maybe have not done, but you would like to do or something you've done before, but you like to do more frequently of um, that Chris shared in terms of getting your foot in the door, post in the comment section. I'd love to learn about that. Chris, this has been a really good recording. I've, I've really enjoyed just chatting with you about getting your foot in the door and how students can go about effectively getting their foot in the door. Um, the last question I'd love to ask you is, is how can our students learn more about your work? I know we've talked about a little bit about LinkedIn. Um, would you be all right if our students connected with you on LinkedIn and you know, is, is there any other way that students can learn more about you and your work? Uh, yeah, they could um, add me on LinkedIn, email me. Uh, my email is chris at unionstudioarch.com uh, and I'll give it to Garrett and you can have it in the, um, you know, description with this. Um, and then on Instagram at Chris Jasinski is my personal Instagram. It's mostly architecture and random thrifting finds and whiskey things I like to do and uh, so that, that's a little personal insight, but, um, yeah, and we're, our company, we're doing a, we're in the middle of a brand refresh right now about to launch that new website in a few months. So, um, but yeah, our company is union studio arch on Instagram and that's on all social media, um, platforms as well. Cool. Awesome. Chris, thanks for being here. Students. Thank you all for being here. I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your evening. See you in our next workshop. See everybody.